Good evening and welcome to the CUNE Academy for this installment of AP Government, where we are building responsible citizens and informed voters one video at a time. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk to you about the incumbency effect. This is one of the most important, if not the most important concept on the AP exam. If you look at AP exams over the years, the word incumbent has been used more times than any other word. All right, and I believe it or not, I do not see it on our word wall yet. So five points for the first student to come in and write the word incumbent up there on uh, Thursday morning. Uh, and for those of us that are still unfamiliar with that term, an incumbent is a current office holder, somebody that currently holds the office. So Barack Obama is the incumbent president. Dick Durbin is your incumbent senator. Brad Schneider is most of yours incumbent representative. Okay. Now the incumbency effect is essentially the tendency for um, incum uh, p current office holders or incumbents to win, uh, win re-election. Okay, so the tendency of those already holding office, okay, to win re-election, the effect tends to be stronger for members of the House than it is for members of the Senate, which again goes against the will of the founders a little bit because they wanted the House to be more connected to the people, but they seem to be the ones that the people keep wanting to let back in. All right. Several reasons exist for this. Uh, just like any list, you're going to want to write down all of them and then circle the top three that you're most likely to remember because you may be asked to recall this on an exam, for example. So probably the number one factor is name recognition. Voters are more likely to recognize the office holder than they will the challenger. And the picture you see there is a guy named Dennis Anderson who ran in the 14th district, that's those of you on the other side of Route 83 from Mundelein High School, um, and lost to Randy Hultgren. Most people did not know his name. Randy Hultgren was in Congress. Obviously, he had more name recognition. And if you notice, most of the signs you see on the side of the road, all it will literally say is the person's name and for Congress next to it, because they're just trying to get name recognition. Uh, one candidate came in our class once and said that each bumper sticker is worth eight votes. So they're just trying to get their name out and have people vote for them. Next one is credit claiming. Now, you don't want to just write credit claiming down. You want to write credit claiming for what? What are they going to claim credit for? The office holder is going to have brought projects and money back to the district. This is called pork barrel spending. Another word I could see on the word wall, but no extra points for pork barrel. That's just something you're going to put up on your own. Um, if you bring money back to your district, whether it's a construction project, rebuilding a bridge, getting money for a high school, getting a road fixed, that's all jobs, that's money, that's something you can take credit for. Uh, Robert Dold and Mark Kirk, when they were your congressmen, they bragged about bringing money back to fix Waukegan Harbor. You get the federal government to foot the bill, you're bringing home the bacon, that's something you can claim credit for when you run for re-election. Casework, is that a good word for the word wall? Um, casework is when an office holder is going to help a constituent solve their problems with the government and the bureaucracy. For those of you filling out student loan forms or have filled out for a passport, you can know that that can be very troublesome, very confusing, and time consuming. So congressmen will have offices in their um, office to deal specifically with casework problems. A constituent will call up and say, I'm out of town, I don't have a passport, I need to get this resolved. They take care of it. Challengers can't do that, so obviously the, when you resolve somebody's problems and you help them manage the bureaucracy or some government agency, they're going to be more likely to vote for you. My father, being a veteran, um, needed to uh, get prescription drugs from the VA. He would call Kirk. Kirk would take care of it. My dad was a very loyal Mark Kirk voter for most of his voting years. Okay. Uh, more visibility to constituents, all right? This is something called the franking privilege, okay? When you are franking, okay, you are able to use your signature as a postal stamp, okay? And you can sign the letter that you're sending back to your constituents, um, and that becomes the postage. You still pay for it, but you don't have to put the stamp on it. You literally just sign your name, and you can send that to your uh, constituents so you can communicate with them and let them know what you're doing. It's a way to help get name recognition and it's also um, a privilege only congressmen have. Challengers do not have that. Okay, um, I have an example here. Um, 
see if we can get it to load up here. Okay. Um, sorry, it's not going to work on this one. Um, I'll show it in class, um, but it's uh, something Mark Kirk had sent me when I was in his congressional district. But it's just a way to get your name out, take credit for certain things. You are banned from sending this 30 days before a primary election and 60 days before a general election, because as you can imagine, it's essentially free advertising, and they don't want that to happen. So, But you can send it out during the year to help get your name recognition out uh, as well. All right, media exposure. If you're an incumbent, you're going to get free publicity during a campaign. Anytime you do an interview, go on a talk show, you're getting media attention, talking about doing your job that your opponent does not. So the media will generally favor the incumbents. That's big time in Senate races because it's very expensive to run for Senate. Uh, fundraising, all right? Incumbents, we're going to see this on Thursday in class. They get a, or Wednesday in class, they get a ton more f uh, contributions from not only individuals, but also political action committees, or PACs as they're called, okay? Um, the reason a PAC is going to donate to the incumbent is they're already in office. They have a relationship with them. They know that they can win, so they're going to continue to donate money to them. Um, PACs are limited, however, only to $5,000. But you'll notice most challengers do not get any PAC money, but um, incumbents get a ton of that, okay? So you're able to generate a lot of money, which helps you get your name out, run TV ads and stuff like that. Okay, you have experience campaigning, all right? If you're a congressman, you have somebody, you have a staff, you have people that know the process, that work in government. Um, your, your office staff cannot work for you and your campaign staff unless they do it on their own time and in their private um, time outside of work because we're not going to pay federal tax dollars to these workers to campaign for you, but it would only make sense that you can campaign for your boss. You have that right to free speech. It just cannot be on government time. So um, you have much ex you have experience in a staff that challengers do not. Okay, you have a voting record. All right, this is what Mayhew was going to call position taking. All right, uh, this can work against you also. Okay, sometimes you might have to take a controversial vote, say on health care. That might hurt uh, your chances at the election booth, but you can at least run and people know what you stand for. They know what they're getting. Um, sometimes challengers don't really have that benefit. Okay, And the last one is gerrymandering or, as it is also called, more politically correct, redistricting. And when the state legislatures redraw these district lines, okay, they are doing this to protect incumbents. They will make deals. They will trade off and say, I'll draw this district to help a Democrat. I'll draw another district to help a Republican. We can keep those same people in office. That keeps government kind of stable. Okay? Uh, in some instances, like what happened in Illinois, the Democrats took over and they redistricted the totally favored Democrats, which hurt Robert Dold, who was an incumbent. But Brad Schneider has a very heavily drawn Democratic district. This picture here is the earmuff district, as they call it in Chicago. You can kind of see the ears, and then here's the handle of it. Uh, this is some hardcore gerrymandering to protect Luis Gutierrez. And you can probably guess why Luis Gutierrez is um, protected in Congress, because he is the only member of the Illinois delegation. That sounds like Gutierrez. Um, but they really gerrymandered his district. This is actually a road here, a road. This is Highway 94 by the airport. That's how big his district is, so they can keep it all connected. So that way, um, he gets reelected and stays in office. Okay, incumbents have that benefit, where challenge challengers do not. And sometimes, if you know that there's going to be a strong or a rich challenger, they will gerrymander the district to prevent that person from being in it. So it makes it harder for them to run. All right. So thanks for listening. That's all for this installment of the Cune Academy. All right, where we are creating informed voters one video at a time. And remember, politics is not a spectator sport. Thank you.